Hey everybody, this is Mr. White. I do not have a cool intro like you probably were hoping or expecting by now. I think next year or sometime over the summer, I gotta get good with video editing and like take classes from Mr. Letarte and like really have like awesome videos. And I gotta get really good at saying like, please like and subscribe and don't be afraid to hit that like button and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not there yet, so all right, we're still we're still going. Um. So, I need to move this, actually, so that you guys can see um, the memes, you know. I like the Jennifer Lawrence meme. I understand that not everyone gets it, because it doesn't make any sense. But, I think it's funny regardless. So, today, <laughs> we're going to do, um, today we're going to do Era 3. Um, and, sorry, I'm trying to move this thing back. There we go. Alright, so today we're going to do Era 3. And Era 3 is 1815 to 1914. This is the beginning of um, kind of what we call modern Europe. And this is where Europe really starts to look a lot more like um, what the world looks like today. Um, we left off with Era 2. And before that, we did Era 1. And remember, our takeaways from Era 1 were the Roman Catholic Church is really losing its power. States are centralizing power and people are starting to think more for themselves. And Era 2 is all this thinking for yourself combined with centralized big fat states means lots of rebellion and revolt. Um, great examples include the Glorious Revolution, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. And so when we left off with the Napoleonic Wars, it's kind of an unfinished story, right? And so that's what we're going to start with today. So our big trends that we're going to be looking at today are kind of a threatened conservative order in Europe. <clears throat> So remember how the conference uh, that ended the Napoleonic Wars in Vienna, um, that's exactly what I, but that's what I was going to say. Yeah, it ends in Vienna, um, and that's in Austria. So we're going to be looking at how is it that Austria is able to kind of negotiate their position and be on top through this guy named Metternich. And we're going to notice how Metternich has this big concert of Europe that seeks to maintain a conservative monarchist order in Europe through international cooperation but is threatened by the Napoleonic ideas of liberalism and nationalism. Nowadays, those don't really go hand in hand, but back then they really did. Also today, we're going to be looking at the triumph of modernity. After the revolutions of 1848, new ideology called modernism kind of starts to dominate Europe. It has a lot of looks and feels to it. On the political side, we see things like nationalism uniting nations like Germany and Italy, liberalism continuing in Britain and France, and science and new subjective understandings of the world clashing, and people expressing their quote-unquote modernity through new industrial methods, and kind of the big one here is imperialism. Probably imperialism should have a bullet point of its own. I probably should have like a number three imperialism, because it's kind of that big of a deal. But um, it kind of also fits with modernity, So and also I was running out of room on the slide. So you know, you do what you can. So let's start with our first kind of big topic, the Age of Metternich. The easiest way to understand the Age of Metternich is to actually link it closer to Era 2. What's really odd is that Era 2 and 3, the dates are not super great. Um, what I mean by that is, preferably, in my humble opinion, Era 2 should be 1750 to 1914 because I do think that the age of Metternich has more commonality and makes more sense to be in the same era as the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars so it's kind of weird that it's in its own separate era it feels sort of like a like an unfinished business so remember the concert of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars um, settles on this Treaty of Vienna which restores old borders strengthens the states of Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and further divides Italy. So it's sort of a continuation of things that had always been at play in European history. There's no big news coming out of the Congress of Vienna. The biggest news maybe is Prussia becomes like a pretty legitimately decently large state. But for the most part, a lot of people are still unhappy with this treaty, despite the fact that it doesn't change much. In fact, they're they're unhappy because it doesn't change much. You have a lot of people in Italy upset. You have a lot of people in Russia upset. A lot of people in Poland who are upset that their country no longer exists and kind of got removed from the world map during the Napoleonic Wars and was never really brought back. 
So lots of anger and frustration. The Concert of Europe um, basically is this coalition of monarchs um, who are going to work together in, quote, concert to, write, to solve international disputes and prevent war. This has a lot of linkages to um, the League of Nations, the UN, NATO, and just the EU nowadays, right? So here we go. We got post Napoleonic Wars Europe. The map's kind of weird. Notice some things. France is big, didn't really lose that much territory. The only place it lost territory was a little bit near Italy, right? Um, so we have this new kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont that is created out of the ashes of Italy and France. It mostly just exists to have a little buffer between France and Austria so that they don't have to actually share a border. And both King, uh, France and Austria are going to want to keep the independence of, the, of Piedmont Sardinia because neither of them are going to want to share a border. Then you can see Austrian Empire is massive, it's huge, it's strong, um, and it has a huge control over the light green German Confederation. And then we have this dark green Prussia, which is kind of not fully united and kind of strewn across the Germanic region. Notice that Poland is a part of Russia now for the most part. A little bit of Poland is part of Prussia, and a little bit of Poland in that area called Galicia is part of the Austrian Empire. Spain and Portugal, Britain are still around, the Ottomans are still around, and we have like this growing power that is like Romania, Moldova, which is over there. They're not really, I, I shouldn't use the word power, they're like a thing, you know, whatever, man. Um, and then the, the Netherlands, Denmark, and our Scandinavian countries are all there. So we got Metternich, right? He is the genius, diplomat, and Austrian prince, organizer of nearly every meeting of the Concert of Europe. He's also super handsome, and he sees any domestic unrest as a threat to all of Europe and seeks to resolve conflicts. You know, he has a bird nose. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. You can always Google that, but the dude has, like, a really, really hooky kind of, like, bird nose situation. It's pretty unfortunate. But, hey, who cares? Because, you know, he kind of, like, ran Europe, so, like, bird nose it up, man. Um, he successfully quells ethnic disputes in his own country. Remember, Austrians speak German, so this is going to be an issue in Austria. So, um, this whole policy of restoring conservative monarchist order Obviously, the bedrock of that policy is going to be France, right? Because France is like clearly the house of, of revolution. So one of the big things that Metternich wants to do is restore the monarchy in France. This is called the Bourbon Restoration. Um, we get to move up from Louis the Sixteenth to the Eighteenth. We had to skip the Seventeenth because you know he did. Um, the new Louis is even more fat and pompous. It appears. Just look at how many chins are there. There's so many chins. Um, this is because the French are kind of divided, right? A lot of the French miss the days of Napoleon, but then there's also some French who are really persecuted in Napoleon, and they've kind of rebranded themselves as ultra-royalists, which is as terrible and dumb as it sounds. They're going to go after liberals, support the monarchy at all costs, and try to basically pretend the revolution never happened and return France to pre-revolution days. So we get these competing ideologies in Europe, right? We clearly have conservatives in charge of Europe, but we also have these liberals and nationalists out there. And because of this growing romantic movement, right, in Europe that really stems from the nationalism and the war from the Napoleonic period, everyone's going to try to co-opt romanticism for their own use. So, like, on the left-hand side, we can see liberals co-opting romanticism through Eugene Delacroix's uh, paintings. On the right-hand side is Neuschwanstein Castle over in Germany. This is conservatives kind of co-opting romanticism. Um, by the way, whenever liberals co-opt romanticism, it's usually about the valiant struggle against the oppressor. Whenever conservatives co-opt romanticism, it's almost always about the past and the good old days and the glory days and religion. And then you have nationalists. Nationalists are going to co-opt romanticism to kind of stress their national story. The thing about nationalists is nationalists can either be kind of nationalist conservatives or nationalist liberals. And in this period, the nationalists are actually allies with the liberals. This is because together they want to defeat the conservative order. Spoiler, Nationalists will later flip to the side of conservatives in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and they'll kind of remain there. 
So to give you some examples of oppression, right, we have Russia um, opp oppressing the Decemberist revolt and oppressing Poland. Um, we have uh, conservative economics at play. I mean, a lot of these conservative governments were more than willing to embrace free trade after the, the success of free trade during the Napoleonic Wars. And you get like this extreme laissez-faire. Um, to be honest, Adam Smith was not always going to, he didn't always say things like, you know, no government involvement whatsoever, as much as people think he does. But there are some people who do say that. Um, a great example of that is like David Ricardo. David Ricardo has been proven wrong time and time again, and he's kind of become um, not the most well-remembered economist. He argued that raising wages would lead to more children, which meant more labor, which meant more unemployment, meaning, you know, more bad stuff. So don't raise wages, right? Keep wages as low as humanly possible. Um, don't worry about raising the lower classes whatsoever, right? Who cares? Because if you do that, they're just going to have more kids, and then you're going to have more labor. He was always worried about surpluses in labor. He always thought that surpluses in labor are a bigger problem than um, wages. He also had Thomas Malthus, whose theory was actually pretty sensible and correct about 20 years before it came out. You see, Thomas Malthus contended in the early 1800s that people are doomed to famine because food supply can never outpace population. And if we look at world population charts up to Malthus, it's like a zigzag, right? It kind of just always reaches to like about a half to billion to a billion and then kind of comes back down. So Malthus is actually right for most of history. It's sort of like this slow, steady zigzag. The problem is, is that right around the late 1700s or late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution starts to break out, and that's when population's like... And therefore, Malthus is wrong, like right as his theory comes out, and he doesn't really know that. So, speaking of Industrial Revolution, it's causing some frustration in the poor, right? Wages are getting considerably lower while working conditions are getting considerably worse. The first Industrial Revolution in Great Britain, for example, is not a great time to live in by any means. Um, the Agricultural Revolution is what makes this possible, right? You can't have so many women in these factories making textiles in the 1820s and 30s um, without farms becoming so productive that it opens the, the doors for this. The big inventions that drive a lot of this are like the steam engine. Notice that on the left we have some sort of steam-powered machine over there, and on the right notice that those um, those looms are not being powered by electricity because it hasn't been invented yet. They're empowered by big spinning bars, right? Notice that the machines are all powered by like a large spinning bar at the top of the, the factory ceiling. And that bar spins because it's connected to a steam engine. So they're essentially steam-powered factories. Um, this also meant that there was lots of nasty fumes, and there was very few windows, and there were no lights, because none of that had been invented yet. And factories were dark, terrible, awful places to live in, or sorry, to work in, and when a fire breaks out, you're dead. So uh, the long-term impacts of out of all of this is that many in the cities often felt they're on their own. Um, people saw a rise in the uh, increment of illegitimate children. Many children were abandoned. People started to marry later. They were not concerned about dowries and, you know, who gets to own the farm anymore because there is no farm. And uh, we start to see that um, women and men start to have very separate roles, right? Um, we start to see that no longer do people work together on the farm. We see that women's work is separate, right? They're cut off from new technology, um, their assumed income is supplemental. They're supposed to work maybe in a factory while they're still single, and then once they're married, they stay at home and raise all the kids and send the kids off to factory work. And a lot of reformers in the early 1800s, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, actually were not trying to give women equal pay. They weren't interested in this, right? That's a 1900s thing or late 1800s thing. Their goal was to just get women out of the workforce because they thought factories were evil, which they kind of were back then. I mean, they really sucked to work in. So they thought the best solution was just not let women work and let them stay to be um, kind of in the home where they're going to be safer. Um, so it kind of vaguely makes sense if you want to not have people get hurt, but at the same time, you're still reducing the economic agency of women. You're still treating them separately and differently. That's not really equality.
So you'll actually notice that the conservatives are the ones pushing for women in the workplace, and the liberals and the reformers and the progressives want women to be pulled out of the workplace. I know, it sounds weird, but it, it kind of makes sense in the logic of the day. Um, a lot of new ideologies kind of came out in 1820s and 30s and 40s that were supposed to kind of challenge the kind of craziness of this new conservative system. Um, you had Jeremy Bentham arguing that, you know, we need societies that, although liberal, have lots of welfare, right, and provide for the poor and have regulations. So he's kind of one of the first advocates of the modern welfare state. You have Saint-Simon and his technocracy, the first person to really argue that society shouldn't really necessarily be run by a democratic government, but society should be run by a very efficient bureaucracy. Um, democracy, he saw, was inefficient, led to revolt, led to unrest, led to Napoleon uh, and French Revolution stuff. Why not just have vast, powerful bureaucracies that run everything? Because everyone loves intellectuals and bureaucrats, right? Um, and then a variety of other thinkers um, come up with this idea of utopian socialism. Um, you have people like Owen and Foyer who are really into this, arguing that capitalism is wrong and we should have government um, and kind of communal societies breaking down social barriers. Um, so these new ideologies are kind of making waves, right? Um, here, by the way, there's Bentham on the far left, and his head is in a museum because he's weird. And then we have Owen there, um, the good guy factory owner, right? So amidst all of this, eventually we get Karl Marx. And Karl Marx is obviously influenced by socialism. He's also influenced by this other strategy, this other uh, ideology called anarcho-syndicalism. Um, and he argues that really the government is bought and paid for by the elites, right? Um, and he believes that society should largely be run by unions, um, which is kind of what anar anarcho-syndicalists believe. But he's better received because he believes that to achieve this, the best way to go about doing it is through a revolution. What's interesting about Marx is revolutions he knows are inherently violent, but he personally believed in nonviolence. So it's kind of like, what? So like, he's not a terrorist, he's not advocating violence, but he's advocating revolution, which is almost always violent. Okay, Marx. Um, he, though, is unique because unlike some of the other ideologies that we're looking at, he does a much better job of defending his. Um, in a series of books like the Communist Manifesto in 1848, and then the much better book, in my opinion, um, 1860's Das Kapital, um, he really defends his understanding of history and communism with lots of logic and actual history. I mean, the dude really was an established historian by the time he died. Um, he also provided some labels that would stick, you know, that idea of the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. But... The Communist Manifesto was actually published in 1848 as the revolutions are going on. It has very little effect when it's published. It won't be until the mid-1850s that people start to really read this stuff. So Marx is too late to the party. A lot of students make the assumption that because a eh, Communist Manifesto published in 1848, revolutions of 1848, is it a Communist Revolution of 1848? It's not, right? Marx has zero, zero effect on the revolutions of 1848. Don't mix that up. So speaking of which, what are these revolutions of 1848? So we have 33 years of Europe under conservative control and a bunch of failed little ethnic and nationalist rebellions. I mean, really, the only place we see a national rebellion that's successful is over in Greece, right? Everywhere else, nationalism has struggled to make gains. It gets crushed with the Carlsbad decrees over in Germany. It gets crushed in Poland. Um, it gets crushed in Ireland and in Britain. Um, it gets crushed in France. Um, so for the most part, a lot of the governments are still very conservative. Some governments have had some liberal reforms, like France had the Revolution of 1830, which kind of introduced a more liberal government under Louis Philippe, and Spain had a liberal revolution in 1820, which ended up leading to all of South America breaking away from Spain. But for the most part, conservatives are still largely in charge, and nationalists are certainly not in charge. So why did it happen? You know, how does this massive continent-wide revolution break out? 
Um, some historians have some claims, right? Some people say that it could be seen as kind of a, a romantic moment in history. Um, some people kind of think it's almost like a humorous joke. It was a serious revolution, but unsuccessful. It was not liberal. It's mostly a social revolt from the lower class. What do we think? Well, I think the best way of understanding 1848 is just general frustration from the lower class um, without always clear political agendas. And lacking a clear political agenda means they're likely not liberal. They're likely nationalist. So let's talk about nationalism. If we can see the 1848 revolutions as kind of angry populist nationalism, things start to make a little bit more sense. It's not like people are, you know, hating their country. They hate their conservative monarchs. They don't necessarily need a bunch of cool new rights. They need their government to work for them, right, and work with them, as opposed to um, sort of issuing decrees to them. So 1848 is a moment where you have lots of poor people who are less worried about voting and more worried about things like wages, living conditions, and an end to serfdom. So what we see is governments taking up that challenge. Governments realize that you don't always need to hand over full political liberties to these people as long as you achieve some success in their standard of living and in their relationship with the state. If they feel represented and cared for, that's enough. So by the end of 1871, we'll get a whole bunch of new governments that try to reflect this. France goes through a couple new governments before settle, settling on a Republican one in 1871. Italy becomes united under a nationalist monarch. Germany becomes united under a nationalist Kaiser. And we see failed nationalist revolutions going on in Spain, Hungary, and Poland. So clearly nationalism is on the rise. Easiest example of this, best example of this is Italy. It's also kind of the first example of this. Um, remember that, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back really quick. Italian nationalism starts with these guys, Mazzini and Garibaldi. Their first kind of big move, right, is over in Rome when they seize it during the revolutions of 1848. But it falls apart. And for the next kind of 10 years, they got to work with Cavour, doing some politicking to kind of help restore Italy. And most of their movement is done through war, right? Italy makes a lot of its gains through small little wars with the help of Cavour and Sardinia Piedmont. And then later, after the 1850s are over, we get into like, um, well, actually even 1859, right? We get the, uh, um, oh, what am I trying to say? No, sorry. Um, after 1866, they have the uh, Prussian-Austrian War. That's when... Um, Italy is able to make some serious gains against Austria and restore Venice, and then it takes the Franco-Prussian War to really fully reclaim Rome. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. So, um, however, at the end of the day, they still unite behind a king, right? Vittorio Emmanuel, who was the king of Sardinia Piedmont, becomes the new king of Italy. And so what we get is this conservative, nationalist, kind of monarchist government. It's not liberal. And Mazzini wanted a liberal revolution, right? He wanted voting with the people. So it appears that nationalists are fighting way more wars and are far less liberal and far more conservative than they used to be. I mean, if you think about the Greek Revolution, there was a lot of kind of liberal sentiment that got caught up in that. We don't see that in Italy, right? We don't see that at all. Um, so Italian nationalism is kind of interesting. I mean, it, it is has all these lofty ideas and it doesn't always reach them. That's why perhaps the better kind of example of nationalism um, for kind of being more true to what its original goals were might be Bismarck. Um, because Germany, unlike Italy, is a much more united state, right? Italy is left behind with this very industrialized north and this kind of agricultural south. It doesn't really feel like one totally unified nation yet, where Bismarck does a much better job of keeping all of Germany on the same page, which might be a harder job, too, because it's so much bigger. Um, Bismarck practices real politique. Um, he pursues his nation's self-interest based on a realistic assessment of cost and consequences without any moral or ethical considerations, right? You do what's best for the country, not what is always the morally right thing to do. So um, he establishes the German Empire, and he does this largely through diplomacy and war. He relies on the industrial sector of Germany to help keep his country going through wartime. 
And although he could not completely transform German culture, for example, he wasn't able to remove the influence of Catholics and socialists in German culture, we do know that the culture comp failed and that the uh, SPD or the, or sorry, the SDP, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, will remain a powerful force. Um, we do see that through the Prussian-Austrian War and the Franco-Prussian War, um, he is able to kind of unite all Germans into one big country. Uh, the exception is Austria, right? People in Austria speak German. There's a couple other areas um, around the borders here of kind of some places where there are still some German speakers who are not fully in the empire. But for the most part, right, we do have a very united Germany. So who's got the better form of nationalism? Both of them rely on war. Both of them establish conservative governments. Um, but German nationalism is a little bit more successful at uniting the entire country and having programs to back it up. To kind of move back really quickly, um, what Bismarck does is he encourages a lot of social welfare programs to help reduce the impact the socialists have on politics. Um, for example, Germany is one of the first countries to allow for universal male suffrage. It's one of the first countries to allow for um, kind of state-run health care, state-run schools, um, and a lot of kind of elements to make up the modern welfare state in Europe. And he does this to make it harder for the socialists to gain seats. Because if the conservatives are going to, you know, do some of these social welfare programs, why would you even need to vote socialist, right? Um, and so the socialists notice that Bismarck is kind of stealing some of their ideas to maintain kind of support among the people. So um, comparing Italy and Germany is usually something that shows up on the, on the AP test. Remember, just keep in mind that um, Italian unification and German unification do have a lot of similarities with some small differences. Um, so other places there's nationalism. France, right? Uh, we know that there is a nationalist revolution in France, um, kind of headed by Napoleon III. Um, he's, Napoleon III starts as president of a liberal France in 1848, because remember, we do have a small little republican government in France for about four years after 1848. But then he actually stages a coup and replaces the liberal government as an emperor. Who would have thought Napoleon would perform a coup and proclaim himself an emperor? I, I, I can't remember if that's ever, I don't even think that's ever happened before. LOL. Yeah, right. Um, so, I mean, like, how could you not see this coming? Um, so he loses control when he was captured in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, that war in 1871 really changes European politics a lot, right? Not only does that allow both Germany and Italy to finish their unification campaigns, it also causes France to change their government. And remember, that war would not have been possible for if it wasn't for Bismarck's diplomacy. I mean, just think about it. Bismarck was able to keep Prussia... Austria and Britain out of that war. So, I mean, he disrupts the balance of power that heavily without anyone else getting involved. That's a pretty masterful diplomat. So, Paris has a quick moment where he goes communist, and then next thing you know, Paris unites under a successful republic, and it'll be long lasting too, from 1871 to 1940. Nationalism in Russia also is a thing going on. A lot of the Russian monarchs are adopting nationalism, and they do this as a way to kind of keep the peasantry from rebelling. You know, if you instill some kind of nationalist fervor, they'll be on your side. But it doesn't really work. Despite all of Alexander II's, you know, commitment to nationalism and even his willingness to issue some reforms, like abolishing serfdom and legalizing local government, he still finds himself largely under attack by the people. You Getting rid of serfdom doesn't mean a whole lot if people still remain extremely poor, which they did. And Russia is still so backwards that anger with the Russian government still results in his assassination in 81. Finally, Austria-Hungary. After Austria loses to Prussia in 1866, Austria struggles to maintain control of its multi-ethnic empire, and the Hungarians are posing too much of a threat. Now, the Hungarians had rebelled in 1848, but Russia helped crush them because Russia did not want a Hungarian-led government on to a, kind of its direct south. So instead, um, what he does 
is he decides to split his empire in half. Franz Joseph will have a Hungarian side to his empire and an Austrian side to his empire, and that's how we get the name Austria-Hungary. Um, this pleases the Hungarians and keeps the empire together for now. But it's super tenuous, right? I mean, he's further decentralizing his control of his country just to maintain power. And for the rest of the next kind of 50 years or so until the you know, fall of Austria-Hungary, the entire country will continually be afflicted by nationalist movements. The only reason the empire even survives is simply because of Franz Joseph's particular cult of personality, popularity, and his ability as a diplomat. And finally, Britain, where we don't really see a nationalist movement. The truth is, is conservatives and liberals were squaring off endlessly, constantly trying to one-up each other in this period. And for that reason, they passed a lot of welfare and reform packages that really helped the middle class and kept people from kind of drifting into the anger that nationalism needs to survive. For example, the Great Reform Bill of 1867 was a compromise struck between liberals and conservatives that expanded the franchise to about a solid third of all adult males in, in Britain including a lot of urban males. And for Britain, this is great reform. Um, the, also, the conservatives at, were um, very united um, in suppressing Ireland, but the liberals were very, very not united in suppressing Ireland. There was a lot of debate over kind of this question of home rule. Home rule was the idea that maybe Ireland could rule itself, and conservatives were like, nah. We need direct control over that place. And liberals were like, maybe? I don't really know. This is a controversial issue. So we don't really see Britain descending into nationalism. And this is just another example of Britain just being one of the most stable governments and stable countries in Europe, right? It's that long history of constitutionalism coming in clutch. Constitutions are pretty good. So we go from Europe of 1815 to Europe of 1871. The map changes a lot, right? Borders become clear, the German Confederation is gone now, we have a big, fat Germany, big, fat Austria-Hungary, big, fat United Italy, big, fat France, big, frat, frat, big, fat Britain, and big, fat Russia. We have these big powers, right? And that's kind of the key. These big powers are all so strong that War is going to be super deadly next time it breaks out. I mean, look how the countries back then were much more divided, much more decentralized, and now they're kind of these big centralized military powers. Also, they're very modern. So let's look at some of the policy and culture that's going on, right? There's, um, or sorry, policy, technology, ideology, and culture that's going on. So we have new inventions. We have street lights, we have cars, we have airplanes, we see cities becoming more industrialized and there needs to be responses to that, like repaving of streets, um, sewer systems, sanitation comes out in the late 1800s, Joseph Lister invents um, a antiseptic and then he gets Listerine named after him. We have uh, Louis Pasteur with his pasteurization process, which makes milk accessible to the public. We have orphanages up in the upper right. So we start to see that these big, centralized, powerful European states are able to actually provide for their people. And with a combination of nationalism and social welfare programs and urban uh, police and sanitation, we start to see these big modern states appear. These big modern states are well known because they have big modern middle classes. These big modern middle classes want to do things like ride bikes, go do sports, go see a movie after work, after they're done with their white collar job working in a bank or working as a secretary or, you know, working as an accountant or, you know, working in sales. Um, after that, you know, they got to they got to take some time off. And we start to see that cult of domesticity, which, you know, started a while ago, sort of an era two thing, mostly um, early era three thing. We start to see that come even more cemented. Right. As men make more and more money, middle class men make more and more money. Women can increasingly afford to stay at home. And art kind of reflects a lot of this, right? Art really celebrates, you know, urban life, you know, the cafe life, you know, the, the streetcar life, the, the ballet, the dance, you know, just the, the niceties of wealth and modernity. 
Science backs this up too, right? Science is saying that things are always getting better. Positivism suggests that humanity is always moving in a more scientific direction. Things will always improve because we're always getting smarter. Um, Nietzsche says things like, um, actually, let's take a little pause here. Let's go back. So posit positivism, right? Very scientific. But then we have other people like Nietzsche, sorry, that's the better transition, who are, you know, maybe not arguing that there's always a logical scientific answer to everything, right? Nietzsche portrays a lot of foundational elements of society as weak. Uh, for example, Christianity to him is a sign of weakness. Um, he values, uh, values uh, heroic behavior and a courageous life. Um, he's famous for the quote, God is dead. And so we can start to see these kind of differences, right, um, forming in the modern era. We still have lots of people trusting in science, and we still have lots of people kind of promoting subjective thought, you know, really evaluating the, uh, really valuing the role of the individual. And all these increasing attacks on Christianity from people like Nietzsche, as well as attacks on Christianity from the scientists, really puts Christianity in an extra tough spot. Right? There's a reason why the Pope in 1870 feels the need to declare papal infallibility, literally a doctrine that says the Pope can never be wrong, because the Pope literally was under attack all the time. People were always calling the Pope wrong. Um, so all of this attack on religion and this sort of war between subjectivity and science going on um, kind of gets backed up by science. Um, Freud is a kind of a weird moment, right? He is a scientist who argues an ideology and a philosophy that actually undermines logical, rational thinking. He says humans are actually extremely irrational, right? Um, he thinks you have a subconscious, and your subconscious doesn't always want rational things. Sometimes it wants totally irrational things. And so he's trying to kind of almost find this, this middle ground between you know, the irrational desires of nationalism um, and um, of the subjective, but also explained scientifically. And so that's what he's doing, right? And this is important because people are really balancing this love of science, but also these kind of crazy, irrational, logical ideas at the exact same time. Uh, a great example would be race, right? People support racism through science. But the science that they use to support racism is totally stupid, illogical, and irrational. Um, so this is where you get like these weird like racial journals where they try to show you what the different races look like. Even though race is a totally made-up concept created by humans, um, there's not there's no races in biology. There's just ethnic groups, which are considerably more nuanced and complex than just saying there's a whole mongoloid race or a whole white race or a whole black race. So all of this weird kind of glorifying of science, but not always science that's rational and logical, um, helps justify imperialism. Imperialism, as we know, is most famous in places like India, China, and the Congo. And um, what it, all this imperialism does is, is essentially lead to um, European wealth in the rubber boom, um, European wealth trading opium in China, European wealth over in India, but also status, right? And we can see that people came into um, imperialism with different goals, right? Britain was, you know, really believed full heartedly in the civilizing mission. If you look at a lot of different British sources, it seems like Britain was mostly into imperialism, as it seemed, if you kind of talk to like the British press in the late 1800s, that they were there for the right reasons, right? They're there to civilize, but they just so happened to make a lot of money in the process. Um, the French are similar, right? Um, they also, like the British, kind of are like, hey, we're down with making lots of money, but we're really there to civilize people. So some other people like Germany mostly get involved with imperialism just to kind of raise their national status. Um, but for the most part, people are justifying imperialism with these seemingly acceptable justifications, right? The idea of civilizing someone just at a glance sounds good. But when we realize what civilizing really means is teaching people to act white and follow white culture and be subservient to sort of these um, white European states, it's not so great. So is this Eurocentric world really better? Well, it's better for Europe, but it ain't always better for everyone else. 
So finally, this leads us into the question. Is this period the golden age of Europe? And for some Europeans, it may have felt like it. And for others, it probably wasn't. Um, remember, for the middle class, this is the golden age. For the lower class, there's still a lot of work to be done. For European colonialism, it's a golden age. For the countries that are being colonized, this sucks. Um, for science and um, the promotion of science, this is a golden age. For pseudoscience, kind of also a golden age, which sucks because you don't want pseudoscience, right? That's bad. So um, all of this kind of leaves us in a kind of a shaky spot as we enter into 1914. Um, as a kind of a catch-up reminder, remember Russia has their own kind of problems, and I don't want to get too deep into like the Russia-Japanese war and how Marxism and Leninism kind of becomes popular in Russia. But just know that this is happening in the background in Russia, right? We, we see that Lenin and, and his boys are kind of um, making some headway in Russia after the, the Russian uh, revolt of 1905. So we get a Europe, right, that has all of these, you know, problems, right? They have um, the whole question of imperialism, the whole question of nationalism, the whole question of growing centralized states, the whole question of militaries, the whole question of science, the whole question of... Um, you know, the loss of Christianity and morality and um, how all these things are under question. Um, everything is questioned. Ah! So um, Bismarck is noticing this as early as 1878 and saying Europe today is like a powder keg and the leaders are like men smoking in an arsenal. A single spark will set off an explosion that will consume us all. I cannot tell you when that explosion will occur, but I can tell you where. Some damn foolish thing in the Balkans will set it off. And as we know, there is some damn foolish business going on in the Balkans, right? We, we know that there's that assassination of Franz Ferdinand. There's your spark. And next thing you know, the world's off to war. And that's where we kind of uh, abruptly end Era 3. Real abrupt. And it, this is a, a hard boundary that almost every historian agrees upon. That there is a fundamental thing that happens in 1914 that separates everything from before 1914 to everything after 1914. Um, World War I is a real game changer. Um, you could argue that it's better to end Era two and 1750-ish and begin Era three around then. You could argue that even 1648 and the Thirty Years' War is not a real great boundary. Why not use the English Civil War um, or the Glorious Revolution even? But I think 1914 is the moment where everyone could come to an agreement that there is a sudden stop to what's, what's going on in this era. So, big takeaways. Big takeaways. Um, oh, I forgot to make a big takeaway slide. What a mistake. So, the big takeaway from era three. Actually, pause. I'm going to pause this, and I'm going to make a big takeaway slide. Be right back. Look at that. A takeaway. So, our big takeaways is that there's lots of modern forces building over this period, right? We see modern forces building up throughout the period. Early on, perhaps some of the biggest modern forces are things like nationalism and things like liberalism. But after 1848, it appears that nationalism is really winning the fight in kind of convincing governments. We see kind of these hyper-competitive forces of imperialism putting Britain and France and Germany into the international stage, fighting for control. And we see people really embracing industrialization as well, allowing their economies to become stronger. And last but not least, I didn't really have room to put it on here, but the attitudes, right? The attitudes that come with modernity, the, the sense of superiority, right? The, uh, the focus on some conscious and primal feelings and the inevitability produced by science makes everyone feel this kind of false sense of confidence, right? Leading in to um, World War I. I mean, these states are far too confident in their abilities. These states are far too militarized for their own good. They're far too competitive for their own good. And what we end up getting is this kind of hot mess of ideology that enables the world to descend into one of the deadliest conflicts in human history abruptly from a assassination of an archduke in 1914. So there we go. There's era three. 
And tomorrow, we'll be doing Era 4, 1914 to the present day, the modern world. And we'll look at that, and it'll be great. So, catch you next time, guys. I'm going to upload this video right now.